there, it's Beth from the West Dallas Public Library, and welcome to another episode of the Let's Go On Vacation Book Club. This is episode three of our trip to the Great Wall. Right now, we are our trip is in China. Okay, so yesterday we learned about the first emperor of China. Chapter four, the great, the first, the first Great Wall goes up. Who is going to build the emperor's enormous wall? Nearly every Chinese man who could walk and dig, that's who. The emperor ordered hundreds of thousands of his subjects to work. Peasants were made to leave their farms. Scholars who never lifted more than a scroll were given shovels. Even convicts were hauled from prisons and marched to the wall with chains around their necks. No one went by choice. No one was paid. All were slaves to the empire. Royal engineers and architects came up with a bold and difficult plan. Beginning at the Yellow Sea in the east, the Great Wall ran 3,000 miles across the northern border, all the way to the Gobi Desert. <clears throat> the, wa the word wall hardly captures all that went into it. There were also brick towers and outposts, thousands of them. That's where the building began. Towers had to be made with wood and bricks. To make the bricks, laborers poured mud into the wooden molds, then baked them in the sun. The bases of the towers were 40 feet square, but the tops were just 30 feet square. Tower walls sloped inward to make them more stable. Three stories high, the tower served an important role for the army. Weapons were stored inside and troops were housed there. <clears throat> Excuse me. The rooftops were lookout stations as well as places to fight. During battles, soldiers shot arrows through the slits built into the ramparts, the lower walls that lined the roof. Towers were also used to send messages. How was this possible? Through smoke signals. When barbarians were spotted, soldiers raced to build fires in rooftop pits. Smoke billowing into the sky meant, calling all troops, come immediately. A special code alerted other towers to the size of incoming armies. One column of smoke meant that 100 enemy troops were on the way. Five columns meant, watch out, 100,000 enemy soldiers are attacking. When a tower picked up the signal, it too built a fire and passed it along. The Great Wall was one long emergency alarm and soldiers were running or galloping along the wall to the scene of a battle. So if you can't picture this, they actually do it in the movie Mulan, the cartoon, um, when they're being attacked along the wall, they light a fire and then you can see in the movie, the posts all along the wall start their fire so it, it signals. Towers were always spaced two arrow shots apart. That way, the enemy was always in firing range from one tower or the next. Outposts were forts built on the enemy side of the Great Wall. The soldiers who lived there formed the first line of defense. They went forth to meet the enemy before the rest of the Chinese armies arrived. When laborers finished work on the towers and outposts, they started in on the wall itself. First, crews built a frame out of bamboo. It stood high and wide as the it stood as high and wide as the planned wall. Nearby, supply crews dug up tons of soil. They lugged it to the walls in woven baskets slung across their shoulders. After climbing the frame on ladders, they dumped the dirt over the top. From there, frame crews took over, spreading and pounding. <clears throat> spreading and pounding the soil into layers no more than six inches thick. Slowly, 
Layer by layer, the great wall rose. When the packed earth finally reached the top of the frame, workers pulled the frame away. Then they moved it down the line to the next spot, and the round of labor began all over again. Remember, they were planning on 3,000 miles of this. Heaps of rubble formed a strong, solid barrier. When a section of the wall was done, laborers lined the top with stones. The wall was wide enough for five horsemen to gallop across side by side. In other words, the top of the wall became a paved road. So think of that, five horses could walk side by side on top of the wall. <clears throat> Chapter five, downfall. That doesn't sound good. The workers on the Great Wall were treated as slaves. Was it possible to escape? No. The emperor sent 300,000 soldiers to stand guard over the workers. Their orders? Prevent escape. Drive the men hard. Use force if necessary. Soldiers made sure that crews toiled from sunrise to sunset. During the summer, that meant 16-hour workdays in blazing heat. During the winter, the temperature often dropped to freezing, and yet the work never stopped. Workers had almost no protection from the weather. They wore whatever clothes they came in, which soon turned into rags. At night, they slept in crowded tents or outside on the ground. For food, they got bowls of rice and boiled cabbage. If supply lines couldn't get through, laborers went hungry for days. Sickness, severe weather, and exhaustion took their toll. It is believed that 700,000 men died building the first Great Wall. No time was taken to bury the dead. They lay where they fell. The wall became known as the longest cemetery on earth. The first emperor placed little value on other people's lives, and yet death was the one thing that scared him. For years, he searched for a magic potion that would make him live forever. Of course, he never found it. So he ordered 700,000 workers to build him a grand tomb where his body would be placed and could, and could enjoy a happy afterlife. The emperor buried the tomb laborers alive when their work was finished, so they could not disclose the tomb's location. That's crazy. The enormous underground tomb covered at least three acres. Standing guard over the emperor's body was a clay army carefully arranged for battle. 7,000 clay soldiers were armed with real weapons, spears, swords, and crossbows. All stood as big as life, yet no two looked alike. So they built clay warriors that were life-size, and no two looked the same. Chinese artists crafted the soldiers from terracotta, a reddish-brown clay. Some knelt at crossbows, some were placed in chariots and pulled by life-size horses. Before his tomb could be finished, the first emperor suddenly died at age 49. The year was 210 BC. No one knows for sure if the hated ruler was killed or died of natural causes. Word of his death flew quickly through the empire. Uprisings broke out, joined by thousands of peasants. Just four years after Qin died, his dynasty was overthrown. A dynasty is a family that stays in control of an empire. It had lasted only 15 years. That's not very long in terms of dynasties. Yet the first emperor's achievements lived on. The Chinese emperor lasted into the 20th century and Qin's basic wall plan was used by subsequent em emperors for 2,000 
thousand years. Okay, so back to the first emperor's tomb. All those warriors that they said they built out of clay. The secret of the emperor's tomb was kept for more than 2,000 years. So no one knew about it. Then in 1974, near the city of Xi'an, some peasants were drilling a well. They dug up part of one of the terracotta soldiers, and that was how the tomb was discovered. Not till 1974. Soon restoration of the clay army began, and it continues today. More than a million people from around the globe visit Xi'an to see the soldiers. Much of the tomb has yet to be unearthed. Remember how big it was three acres? So they haven't even dug it all up yet. The Chinese fear that the air may destroy the priceless treasures within. Ancient texts di disclose that the tomb contains a model of the Chinese empire. Gems and pearls on wooden roof shine like the sun. Okay, gems and pearls on the wooden roof shine like the sun, moon, and stars. Models of China's great rivers made of liquid mercury flow through the tiny kingdom. Recent findings suggest that the burial ground is much larger than anyone had thought. Maybe 20 square miles. 20 square miles. That's, that's big. I'm going to look. I'll put in the, um, I'll put in the comments or somehow I'll lead you guys. I'll show you pictures of the terracotta army. It's pretty amazing. Okay, chapter six, peace along the wall. China had always closed itself off from the outside world, but that started to change in 206 BC when the Han Dynasty took over the throne. Lasting 426 years, the rule of the Hans became a remarkable time in Chinese history. Han emperors, opened China's gates wide and invited in other nations. The Great Wall took on a brand new role, a peacetime role. The Chinese had suffered terribly under the heartless rule of the first emperor. So the first goal of the Han Dynasty was to restore peace and harmony to their people. Scholars were treated with honor again. Buried books were dug up. Yay! Soon, the arts and learning thrived. Scientists invented paper, the first in the world. Writing on bamboo scrolls or stones was no longer necessary. Han rulers had little to do with the Great Wall at first. The Chinese people were fed up with the project. But in time, the steppe nomads began raiding again. Remember them from the beginning of our book? In 141 BC, a Han emperor named Wu Di took action. Chinese troops launched an all-out attack against tribes living near their border. The barbarians were driven farther back into the steppe. Meanwhile, Wu Di sent workers to repair the Great Wall and keep raiders from returning. Emperor Wu Di also built 300 miles of new wall Planning it was easy. He simply followed the first emperor's design. Walls packed, walls of packed earth, towers, and outposts. The surprise was where the new wall went. It was built in the endless, empty wasteland, wasteland of the Gobi Desert. A long chain of towers was also added beyond the wall's end. The last tower reached the very edge of China's western border. Beyond the border lays routes to the Western worlds of Europe, Asia, and Africa. Why did Wudi extend the Great Wall into this forbidding desert? He had decided to open up trade with the West and use the wall to safeguard travelers. The Chinese had treasures found, had treasures found no place else in the world. The other nations were eager to buy China's teas, spices, porcelain, paper, jade, and, most prized of all, silk. By then, the Chinese had already been making silk for 3,000 years. 
Other nations didn't know how to make the beautiful shimmering cloth, and the Chinese were not about to tell them. If other nations wanted silk, they had to travel all the way to China to get it. A trade route took China, a trade route to China took form that would prosper for centuries, and it became known as the Silk Road. The Silk Road was not actually a road. It was a name given to a network of trade routes that led to China. The start-off points were distant lands in Asia and Europe, as much as 4,000 miles away. All routes came together at the farthest tower of the Great Wall. From there, traders traveled along the wall in long camel caravans. Going through the Gobi Desert put their lives at risk. Water was nowhere in sight. Sunlight baked down nonstop. Whipping winds blew the desert into towering mountains of sand. Without camels, the great beasts of desert travel, traders would not survive. <clears throat> traders ended their journeys at different points. Some braved the long journey all the way to China's east coast. Thousands of soldiers at the Great Wall protected traders from bandits. Their jobs were something like those of today's police or border guards. Soldiers checked passes at the gates, enforced the rules, and captured outlaws. Rarely did soldiers need to fight. Peace reigned along the Great Wall. Even the steppe nomads became friendly trading partners with the Chinese. Still, peace along the wall would not last forever. That's very foreboding. Okay, we'll stop there. We'll pick up tomorrow where I'm guessing peace does not reign. All right, well, thank you for watching another episode of our Let's Go on Vacation book club, and I'll see you tomorrow for episode four. Bye.